Our uh, talk today is by uh, two uh, wonderful researchers. Uh, Dr. Michel Milade is Professor of Communication Studies in the Wilkinson College of Humanities and Social Sciences at Tapan University. Before she moved to Southern California, although she was previously Miss USC uh, graduate, uh, she served as the founding director of the Penn State Qualitative Research Interest Group, which is an interdisciplinary community of researchers involved in the supporting, uh, in supporting qualitative inquiry. Her research addresses human communication and health, including areas such as substance use prevention, suicide, and families' mental health. Her community-based participatory research has involved numerous creative projects to translate research findings into social change. For the past 20 years, she has served as the principal qualitative methodologist for a National Institute on Drug Abuse line of research. This work has developed one of the most successful evidence-based substance use prevention programs in the United States and reaches youth in 43 countries worldwide. She has lectured, conducted research, and served as a consultant at universities across the US and internationally. Please join me to welcome Dr. Michelle Milade to our campus. <laughs> She will be joined uh, by Dr. Michael Heck. He is a distinguished professor of communication arts and sciences and crime, law, and justice at Penn State University. The National Institutes of Health has funded Dr. Heck's long term research on drug resistance strategies continuously since 1989. That is a remarkable feat for anyone. He was the one to forced to study the social processes of adolescent drug offers, including an examination of the role of ethnicity and acculturation in these processes. The project has produced a number of theoretical advances, as well as developing an efficacious multicultural school-based intervention for middle school students that, since its adoption by DARD, you all know that it means, uh, DARD America, believed to be the most widely disseminated middle school drug prevention program in the world. A new elementary version of the curriculum based on social emotional learning is being implemented worldwide as we speak. His book, Adolescent Relationships and Drug Use, summarizes some of this work. I'm pretty sure our bookstore carries it. And the video tapes produced for the project have won numerous international and national awards, including a series of 2,000 regional Emmy Awards for student productions. Dr. Hex has received numerous awards, including the National Communication Association's Gerald R. Phillips Award for Distinguished Applied Communication Scholarship and the Society for Prevention Research's Mentoring Award. Please join me to welcome Dr. Hex to our campus. <laughs> they will both talk to us today about why it's supposed to work and why it is not working. Or not, as the case may be. Thank you so very much for that lovely introduction. I'm actually going to start with a story. It may seem off topic here, but my mom is a wonderful cook. She spent a couple of years trying to perfect a cheesecake recipe. Okay. A cheesecake recipe. And she had all the ingredients, all the measurements, the time it was supposed to be in the oven, everything. So I, when I was first learning how to cook, I'm like, okay, I can do this. For a family event, I'm going to make her cheesecake. But I didn't have sugar. I had sweet and low. So, does anybody know sweet and low, how it's concentrated? It, it's like a ratio of one to three. Okay, so you need one sweet and low for like three tablespoons or teaspoons of sugar. Well, I had bunches of sweet and low, so what did I do? Three cups of sugar. And poured them all in. What do you think happened? Yeah, exactly. It was totally inedible. I thought I was being creative. I thought I was being creative. Here is this, this cheesecake recipe that was, was developed down to a science. 
but then I wanted to do it. I changed an ingredient for convenience sake, and it totally didn't work. Should have worked in theory. It was a recipe. It called for that. I thought it's sugar. It was low as sugar, but it's not. Okay. So I'm going to go back here, and that's a way of introducing here the best laid plans of mice and men. We develop health interventions. We develop them with care. We spend lots of time developing them. And then they go out into the field, and somebody puts sweet and low instead of sugar that we have developed there. Now, somebody could put chocolate sauce on the cheesecake, and it could be better than what we planned. So what we're going to talk about today are ways that we adapt Okay, in the field. We develop health interventions. We put them into the field. They get adapted. Historically in the field, they say we should have fidelity, right? We should have fidelity and do our interventions the way that they're planned without any adaptions. Adaptions are, adaptations are bad. So we're going to challenge that a little bit and say, you know, adaptations are. They're going to be. So let's live with it. Let's roll with it. There's my little cheese. Um, although prevention programs are developed carefully and implementers, such as teachers, in our case, we have school-based interventions, are trained to implement programs of fidelity, real-world events sometimes conspire to influence program delivery in ways program developers do not imagine. Again, we cannot anticipate all the way that people implementing, whether they're medical assistants, medical educators, teachers, or in the DARE, in the case of DARE, officers, going to implement our programs. So what we're going to talk about today is creating, adapting, and disseminating effective health messages, in particular interventions. We're going to talk about developing new messages, adapting evidence-based messages, intentionally and studying unintentional adaptations, and then a little bit about dissemination here. So you know, you ask to yourself, do we still have to worry about drug use? The, the war on drugs in my era. Um, we, we don't hear that rhetoric so much about the war on drugs anymore, but it is still clearly a problem. Uh, again, reducing substance use is one of the objectives of Healthy People 2020. It's still an issue. And uh, how many of you uh, know someone who has had a problem with drug addiction or, or substance use problems here? It's still replete across cultures. Urban, rural, you are going to talk a little bit about urban and rural kinds of things, across ethnic groupings. So it's still a problem. We still need to build health interventions for this. And I'm going to give it over to Michael now to talk a little bit about developing our program. We're going to try to confuse you by switching back and forth. Um, the program we created uh, was called Keeping It Real. It's a school-based multicultural intervention that grew out of uh, Dr. Miller Day's master's work, actually. So those of you who are students here, long-term, big, great things can grow out of the work that you're doing right now. He was my advisor. <laughs> I'm old. I'm old. <laughs> so, for over 25 years, we've been trying to do two things. One is understand the social processes by which drugs are offered. Some of you know the uh, Just Say No movement that emerged in the 1980s. Nancy Reagan was actually uh, pushed this, this idea. Um, it was based on real, real science, which was that we needed to understand what was going on when kids were off for drugs, and what did they say, what, what, what went on. But it turned out that not too many people actually studied what went on in that situation and making it up. And that was the basis for the intervention that we created called Keeping It Real, which proved effective in reducing alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana use in a 14-month period. Um, so, what we thought we were doing was developing a method for creating interventions. So we thought the methods that we, we used, we went out and studied what happened, and then took those narratives, created performances, and created a curriculum out of those performances, were something that would be replicated as a method. Well, we did this, and suddenly uh, the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices labeled us an evidence-based program, and people wanted to buy this program. You know, we're professors. We didn't even have money to make copies of the videotapes to sell them, to, to, not to sell them, to just mail them out. So we suddenly became a commodity, and people did not want to go through the effort of creating their own program using a the method. They just used, they wanted to use the program we created because it was the only multicultural evidence-based program. In particular, it was the only one that included uh, information and cultural reference to Latinos. And, and so it became widely used and was disseminated in, in, in a number of ways. 
So the dissemination process, as uh, Dr. Military said, traditionally tries to seek the depth. So you create this program, and then you try to replicate exactly the way you want to talk in various different places. And any change from what you've designed is seen as an error or bad, or something to be eliminated. And um, some of the programs have been more successful. Um, a guy named Olds has a nursing program where he trains home nurses, and he's been pretty good at, at getting fidelity to, to that program. Most of the school-based programs, maybe not so much so. What actually happens, uh, most of the time they don't, they don't, rec they don't uh, adopt an evidence-based practice. If they do, they use some of it, they mix them together, they add their own things. I just met with our local school district in State College, and um, they said that they don't really want to use my pro program. What they want us to do is work with them and integrate three programs they have into something just for them. And I said, well, you lose the evidence base claim from that, and they said we didn't, they didn't care. They just wanted to do what they wanted to do. So, uh, so to, rarely do programs actually get used the way they're designed. So what we've argued is that because the actual practice is described as this, this adaptation, that in reality, what we need is a practice-based science of prevention. We need to base what we do and what we think about when we design prevention programs uh, based on how they're going to be used. When we, we come up with a different definition there, we call adaptation about two, which is fairly controversial in the prevention field. And at this point, some people throw things at us, and I try to duck. But um, some people like it, some people don't. Usually people who are out in the field, how many of you have been in the field trying to do health work or some work with kids or something like that? Well, not too many of you. Well, then you know what I'm talking about, because it's not whatever I tell you to do, you're going to do your own thing anyway. <laughs> So based on that, designers should reinvent for new populations, implementers will adapt, and participants are not passive recipients. Now we're not going to spend a lot of time on the last one. We could do during the Q&A, you can bring this up. But often in prevention theory, they assume that if I'm doing a prevention message for you, that you're just sitting there and sucking in and pounding into your brain or something. But we know that people aren't like that. That they have cognitive processes and interpretations and social processes. And, and uh, that, that's probably all we'll say at this point. Unless you have some questions. So this is the overall model that we've come up with to talk about the process of adaptation. Um, going in various different directions and looking at the three forms. We're going to emphasize the top two um, portions, set, section segments. Back to Dr. Okay, Miller Day. Okay, designer adaptation. So the thing, uh, again, that whole thing about fidelity, keep it the way it is, don't change it, really negates the, 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 the need to adapt to different populations and to different audiences. So we're from the field of communication. You need to do audience analysis. You need to know who your, um, who's going to get the intervention and the messages that they will be getting. So the principle of cultural grounding for health message design uh, starts with culture, obviously, is identifying from the ground up. So instead of from the top down, so this is what we know, what works, and this is the information we know that they need. Let's create this intervention, send it out. It's instead going from the bottom up. What is this culture? What are the values? What are the norms? What are the, the standard ways of interacting around whatever this health topic it might be? So starting with the culture and addressing its complexity, multiple identities. Um, again, we have the strongest influence. Messages influence us very strongly when we see ourselves in our group memberships represented and reflected and acknowledged, not ignored. Our very first curriculum that we're going to talk about in a minute is multicultural. The most effective one was multicultural. We did test, again, specifically a, a Latino version, a black and white version, and a multicultural version, and which one do you think was the most effective across um, black, white, and Latino populations in, that, in, in the particular area we were testing it, it was multicultural, because everyone saw themselves reflected in those messages and in those images. Um, active participation of cultural group members in message construction. This is, I'm going to pause, because this is really important. Instead of all of us academics up here just saying, this is what we, the messages should be, really talking to the people who are going to be our recipients, who are going to be the people who are targeting, the target population members. What are the messages? How do we get them to help us? construct messages so that their voice is represented as well in the intervention. So
So for us, our programs are culturally grounded prevention messages, and we've coined the from kids, through kids, to kids, creating kid-centric health messages because we start by talking to the kids. What are their messages? Where are they coming from? And if I talk with rural kids, their experiences of drug offers in particular, our program is not about don't do drugs. Our program and our intervention is much about communication competence. It is about being uh, socially competent in, if we choose to resist substances. And it's about decision making and making healthy choices. Uh, but getting youth narratives in, in rural cultures may be different than youth, uh, say, say, Orange County versus San Francisco. Um, youth are involved in the narrative message development, and youth are involved in actually pilot testing the intervention itself. So why narrative? Why kids' stories? Why do we want kids to tell us their stories? Narrative evidence, so again, we have statistical evidence, uh, say, you know, 80% of Kids will X, okay? Well, kids don't often see themselves in 8%, what that 8% is. They often see themselves in the stories of others. So when I got offered drugs, or when I was at this party and this happened, I didn't know what to do, and so X. Narratives give voice to student experience or youth experience. It, it paints a picture to illustrate some of the statistical evidence that we might provide. It engage, it's more engaging sometimes than statistical evidence. It often reaches low knowledge audiences much more than statistical evidence might. And oftentimes, in just telling a story, it renders complex information more understandable. So we want to create new narratives for kids who really haven't really thought that, so we have fifth grade, uh, seventh grade interventions. We want to get a kids at that cusp before they really started using so large levels of use. Um, so we want to create new narratives of resistance, okay? New narratives of new norms, new narratives, new stories of how they can interact when they get offers of, of substances, alcohol, tobacco, other drugs. We want to reinforce healthy narratives. If they already have certain narratives that are replete in this particular cultural group, we want to reinforce those in the intervention that we have. And then any unhealthy narrative, what we deem as unhealthy in terms of substance use, we want to be able to challenge and provide uh, alternative narratives for them to embrace, hopefully, uh, in that situation. So the narrative engagement theory, and we have several publications, and these aren't the only two that, that deal with this, so we have narrative messages that include character setting, actions, problems, and solutions. We have video, we have a 10 lesson curriculum, and there are videos in five of them, um, but there's a storyline across all 10 lessons. These help build a novel mental models, alternative ways of thinking and understanding, and not just don't do drugs, but alternative, there's some gray in there alternative ways of thinking about substances and substance use, giving them behavioral models of cool kids who don't engage in alcohol and drug use, and improving narrative knowledge, which isn't just knowledge of facts and understandings and, and, and thinking cognitive. Narrative knowledge is experiential. Yeah, I've been there. I totally understand there. I've been in that situation. Uh, and, and, and I didn't know what to do, or maybe now I do know what to do. Here are some alternatives for me. Um, leading to changes in skills, shaping norms, attitudes, and intents, more cognitive, and then social proliferation. We want kids to talk about the videos. We want kids to talk about the messages. We want them to talk with their other kids, the other, their peers. We want them to talk with their family members. So we want this proliferation of the message to happen across the, not just in the classroom, but across the school and maybe into the households. And we predict that this will impact health behaviors. How do we do this? So our method that you talked about, that we, we thought we were developing this method, is we start by interviewing, do a lot of interviews with our target population, getting stories, getting stories of when. So it's drug offers, but it's also stories of when you used. It's stories of when family, how family and friends have been impacted. Um, so what are the messages here that you've gotten from, from the situations that you've been in? Uh, doing focus groups, not only with kids, but with people who work with kids. So focus groups with, say, say teachers, 
um, counselors, individuals who work with the target population. Um, we always have a teen advisory group, so at every step of the way, they can give us feedback saying, yeah, that's, that's really hokey, that's really corny. <laughs> having them de develop our messages like the, the um, logos um, and having them really be part of message development. Uh, video development from kids through kids to kids. So from kids, the interviews, the narratives, through kids. We always have kids who've never had uh, younger than high school, but high school age kids creating videos based on the narratives that we collected from the younger kids. Collect the narrative, develop these video interventions with guidance by professionals. Um, the high school kids creating these videos to go into the curriculum that is then goes to kids. So from kids through kids, developing those messages, those media messages to kids, the audience. Um, and then we adapt the curriculum, and we're going to talk about it a little bit. We've, we've adapted it in many ways. Uh, for different audiences, and then we go right back to the beginning. What you know, what's working, what's not working, and keeping on adapting in that way. So, keeping it real is the name of our curriculum. Keeping it real, K I R. Okay. Nancy Reagan, just so you know the drugs. From a communication perspective, we've learned that actually cross cultures, cross regions, there are pretty much four ways. Resistance strategies that seem to be effective. Refuse, explain, avoid, and leave. That was our original Keeping It Real logo that the kids designed, and that was back in the 80s. Um, so refuse, explain, avoid, and leave. And we, we keep expecting new kinds of resistance strategies to emerge with, with all the people that we've talked to. But most resistance strategies can fall into those categories. Keeping it real, R-E-A-L, stands for refuse, explain, avoid, and leave. And Mike is going to talk more about the curriculum. Okay, so as Dr. Day mentioned, it's a narrative intervention. So it's, the idea is that we have these stories that, that we want to either reinforce healthy models or reshape the, the stories that they have. The, the approach is not to be moralistic, and we train the teachers and the other implementers not to do that, not to use fear messages. Fear messages are pretty effective on adolescent kids. They don't work very well in those situations. And so, so basically, our intervention is involved with the stories that kids tell, fed back to them, and discussed in the classroom. And what we're trying to do is to talk to them about the choices and the options and the way they make decisions about risky situations in their lives and give them a new way to think about those things. And you can see that five of them uh, are video-based. We'll uh, play some of the, we'll the videos. First video sets the stage, gives an introduction, attempts to get the kids. Well, I'll, I'll stop there, and maybe when you watch it, you kind of think attempts to do. And then one video for each refusal strategies. So this is very much about how to get along with their friends, how to talk to their friends, how to form healthy relationships, how to deal with conflict. Okay. These are the narrative elements that, that we have in the curriculum, the videos, discussions, role plays, all created out of the kids' own stories. So these are the interviews that Dr. Miller they refer to, create these, create all of these different narrative elements. Okay, so this is the first video. This is the introductory video for the multicultural intervention. And when we show you like the rural video, let's see if you can maybe pick out some contrast. Think about what you see as similarity and difference. So this is the video that the there it is. That South Mountain High School, which is a performing arts high school created for the schools in South Phoenix.
kids to do all the work. We write the scripts, we go out and shoot it. In this program, we get to work every position, learn everything, and then choose what we want to uh, get into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. grade schools and we asked them like who's the most popular drug, what band, and we just like to make a story out of it. I we script right for during the summer, the two week program that we came to and it's like because everybody can relate to it because they're like that's here and like I know these people and like, I can put myself in their place and I just how what would I do in a situation like that. So it's more realistic they can relate to the surroundings and the people that are around us that they know what's going on around. What we're doing in our different sets in these uh, videos that I haven't seen done in any other videos is we're using um, realistic looking fake substances like vitamin B for crack or uh, oregano for fake food. Okay, and in most other things, they don't really show them. Okay, so uh, this was intended to be a multicultural urban video. Is there anything that would lend you to believe that we accomplished or didn't accomplish our goals? Is there anything urban about it? I'm grappling with the multicultural term. And, um, so there is American culture when you're right. uh, talking international, but the, the students that I saw in that video, uh, I wouldn't consider it the diversity that's represented in the American population. Right. It looks like a, a small segment of multiculturalism in the US. Okay, first of all, it was developed for the schools in South Phoenix. 65% okay, of the kids in those schools are Latino, mostly of Mexican origin. Uh, now, 20% at the time we were doing this were white, and about 10% were African American. So it reflects the cultures largely of those three groups. We didn't, we didn't get more of the videos, but what happens is as the videos develop, they're based on narratives of members of each of the groups. And so there are narratives from all of the groups. I have to tell you that this is a, kind of a grant thing. We started doing this as ethnicity, and we got labeled the ethnic group in NIH. The differences by gender were much bigger than they were by race. Youth culture overrides a lot of the, the ethnic differences in, in, multiple, in these schools because they were highly integrated. So there are elements like that that, that that are true. And that's one of the reasons that we were surprised, for example, when schools in Georgia and, Miami, and, and Florida and New York started to ad adopt these videos because there were both Latinos in them. It just seemed like it was not totally appropriate, but then they would say to us, but we don't have anything that's any element of Latino culture, so please let us use it. What, what did the video attempt to do? Anything? Anything you got out of that? What do you think the purpose of the video was other than just introducing the program? Why did the kids talk in the video? Why were the performers talk? I guess it's okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of what you're referring to, we're getting credibility and authenticity. We're less likely to resist the message given if it's uh, something you relate to. We did. We did the whole thing ourselves, right? And then they're involved in it and how they were involved in it. Eventually they talk about why they're involved in it. Yeah. So there's a whole identi identification process beginning. There's the overview, the fact it's narrative. Um, it, it starts off with that shot on the freeway. Um, you really won't see that in uh, Central Pencil. Can I say it? Yeah. Central, Central Pencil, Tucky. Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Kentucky in between. Um, so anyway, that, that's the opening video of the, the first one. Did they have any opinion leaders or emerging opinion leaders within the target population? OK, this is a great, great story. When we worked in South Phoenix, huge neighborhood in South Phoenix. It's just really, really big. Um, thousands and thousands of people live there. When we got there, we discovered, not unbeknownst to us, there were no shopping centers and no movie theaters in the entire neighborhood. All of the kids from this neighborhood, 45 schools are involved in our study, got on the same bus and went to Alachuki, which is a white middle class neighborhood just outside of South Phoenix, to the same shopping center to go hang out. Those are the days when 
kids on the upper shopping steps, right? And these kids that you see became huge stars. People, middle school kids would be running up to them and say, oh, we saw you in the videos in our school, you're a really good actor, you're going to be a star. The woman that you saw talk about up at Harvard, by the way, um, pretty cool. Um, and, and actually, one of the people in our cast, unbeknownst to us, high school kid, was a very serious alcoholic. And the little kids were running up to him, and he said, um, the sisters and the brothers need me. And he went cold turkey. I tracked him for four years. He was sober for four years. We saved, I believe we saved that kid's life. Totally unmeasured, totally unreflected in any of our findings. Probably the biggest success we've maybe ever had in 27 years of prevention research. But yeah. Uh, yeah, they do, and that's one of the things that we lose when the program goes national because there's not that feeling of, I know that kid, he's like my, my, my friend's father, brother, and cousin, and things like that, which you get in the rural communities. So this study, as I said, there were 45, uh, 45 schools, there were four different conditions. The videos, the Latino condition, were made up only of the stories for, that, that we got from Latino kids. There were actors from different racial groups, but mostly, mostly the stories were all Latino. Um, I can talk about why it became white, black later. The multicultural mix-up. We we gave the pre-test, three post-tests. The last post-test, 14 months after the intervention ended, in which we find uh, using growth model, general estimating equations, we find statistically significant effects on tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana use. This is kind of graphically related. What's interesting in this. Uh, that you don't always find in, in this population is the fact that marijuana use is higher than tobacco use, but that actually reflects you know, city Phoenix and uh, Latino culture and, and their choices. I'm sorry, so, could you explain what the control was? I'm sorry, yeah. control group did not continue with what they wanted to do. And, and one of the problems with school based prevention is you can't tell the school, well, don't use anything there. So some of these were using evidence based programs at the time kind of waters down the effect. But yeah, they continue to use what they, what they, whatever they were using up to that point. And then we gave them the curriculum afterwards. So they, 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 in fact, many of the schools to this day are still using it. Um, well, we can talk about that too. Uh, so currently, currently finishing up a project in rural Pennsylvania where we adapted Keeping It Real, regrounded Keeping It Real to a rural community did the research that uh, then attempted to identify what we saw as the key factors. The biggest difference in REAL is that for the explained factor, uh, rural kids say, uh, that's not who I am, and they all know. The only other, bio, other adaptation beyond that were among, there's a group at the University of Central Florida that adapted it to teaching Latino sexual pressure resistance, and the other strategy that came out of that discussion was I would punch him in. So um, I don't know if they actually do that, but they said they do. Um, new materials, new role plays. Uh, they're the eighth grade uh, year, they do four booster lessons where they create their own messages. That's part of the book. And this is the, um, the new logo that was created by the kids for, for their own. And here is the video. Let's go to the tape. Well, all right, everybody, quiet on set. We're going to get things started, OK? Yeah, ready? And action. We're going to start with the black shot and we're going to pan over. I want like, the kids to see what high school is really like. Amish people. Yeah, we're Amish people. Cow, no cows, no Amish people. 
Don't portray us that way. So. Um, uh, any, but you got the same idea with the kids trying to say, oh, we made this, it's us, it's from kids, through kids, to kids, establish some identification with it, um, and, and then send it really immediately in rural environments, so it looks like them. There, are, there were no other programs nationally that have been created for rural kids and validated on use for rural kids. This is the first program that, that will have fulfilled that purpose. It's uh, pretty surprising 20% of the country, 20% of the kids in the country are raised in rural environments. Just to go to the purpose. So, uh, there, really quickly. So, there came to us and said, uh, have any of you been through there? How many of you like there? <laughs> you like the new dare. So I can tell that dare started in LA, um, and, and they always created their own interventions. And after a number of years and a number of programs that, shall I say, did not show the effects they would like, um, they decided to adopt an evidence-based program. They looked at a bunch of them, they decided we fit them the best, and Penn State didn't charge them very much. And uh, so we created the middle school version, verified it with them, 250,000 kids, 23 countries. Then they decided that they should redo their elementary program when they got terrible results in Philadelphia. Um, and that is just in the field now. It'll go to about 1.25 million kids and 44 countries around the world, um, making it the largest prevention program in the world. Um, it's a little daunting to have something along that way. Well, this is the, the cover. Skip this. Just a brief intro. It's a national video. So the challenge is, is it's national. How are you culturally grounded? So that's that's a question to consider, right? These are the representatives that give you a sense of what that intro looked like. There are rural, urban, and suburban versions of these videos, but they all have the same intro, which is national and national. Now, the, 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 that's great curriculum. You might have said with this. Um, we, we chose a little different because fifth grade kids are, are definitely very, very few of kids are actually using substances at this point. So we're getting them at the decision-making stage, the time when they are really pulling up away and becoming independent thinkers. Um, we started out with live action with these kids, but we are using peers. So we're using these 10 to 12 year old kids where, uh, aside from Lisa's wonderfully talented kids, trying to get real full performances out of them is, is a challenge. So, so what we, we chose to do to, for, again, for kids is that we, we are using live action and animation. So the intro of the videos for the, the, the fifth graders um, for Dare is live action, these live action characters, but then they morph and transition into animated characters at the end of the very first lesson. And then there, they, there's live action and animated characters throughout the entire um, curriculum. But I'll, I'll show you just a little bit of a clip from, from one of these. Hey there, I'm Josh, and you're in my big brother Michael. Do you really think he's perfect? Last night, he did something he wasn't supposed to. He told my mom he was visiting his friend Daryl when, for real, he went over to Austin's and there wasn't an adult at home. Austin kind of gets into trouble a lot, so my mom doesn't want to go to hang out with him. And she really doesn't want him to go over there without an adult at home. So Michael says to me, Austin needed me to see some cool videos, and he was going to get mad at me if I didn't go. So, if you don't tell mom, she wouldn't even know, right? And I was like, what? I just looked at him and said, no way! Mom has a way for him everything! I'm not going to cover for you. What do you think will happen when Mom does find out? Oh well, I'm off to my karate class. My friend talked to me into taking a chance and trying karate, and I said no for a few months. And then I tried it. I'm really glad I did. I really love it. Hiya! So again, we, we go into positive risks, not just drugs are evil and bad. What are some positive risks that we take in our lives? Trying karate, you like it, you're doing well. So again, just a snippet of some of how we're customizing um, the curriculum to fit different audiences. Now let's move on, because we only have a few minutes here, and I have to like, yeah, about three or four minutes, because I want to take questions. 
That's designer aspects. That's us as designers adapting for different audiences. For the, because it's for, uh, for kids, you know, through kids, two kids, um, trying to adapt. Now, but we hand it off, right? We create these, we hand them off to teachers to implement or to officers to implement. We're really interested in how are they changing the recipe, right? How are they altering the recipe? What's happening in the classroom? So school adoption of evidence-based programs are very popular now because, for example, SAMHSA has a registry of effective evidence-based programs. So if I'm a school principal, I can just go to this list, like Dara did, and choose what are the effective evidence-based effective programs out there for my topic here. Obesity prevention, drug prevention, what have you in terms of that. So they're becoming much more prevalent. Um, so we, we did a study here. We did 31 teachers um, in 25 schools, 73 seventh grade lessons that we, we, we studied. We wanted to know the degree of implementer change, types of changes, reasons for changes. We got teacher self-reports as well as we got observer ratings of a randomly selected uh, 276 of the 70, 730 videos the teachers put. We had uh, videotapes at the back of the classroom, and the entire lesson was videotaped. All these lessons shipped over to us, and we did, they were all digital, so we have all this digital data. If anybody's interested in doing videotape analysis, come talk to me. Um, but we randomly selected 276 videos to look at the adaptations the teachers were making. Teachers reported that 32% of the time they delivered it with fidelity. They did it as, as we asked them to do it in the curriculum. However, the observers, when they rated it, 2.6% of the lessons were developed with fidelity. Uh, I'm not going to go over all these, but suffice it to say is partially omitting the lesson component was most, was most popular because it was coded as that if they left out something. Okay. But we don't know uh, from just this if it was an important something. What I think is consequential are, is completely omitting. There was clearly a component of that lesson that we put in there for a reason. So completely limiting it, eliminating it, adding their own content, their own two cents and in information, and revising content. Doesn't mean that what they added was inherently bad, but we just don't know. It wasn't controlled and the message wasn't in line perhaps with what we had developed revising the content, um, changing, say, something that was supposed to be done as an individual into an entire class event. So what if it's about privacy? What is asking kids to disclose some information? You make it a full class activity. Or if it's something that we wanted to establish norms and we wanted it to be a whole class activity, instead you do it as an individual or dyad or something. So again, these kinds of changes, there's, there's all sorts of, we have wonderful examples. I'll oh, give the example of the one guy who, <laughs> I think we try. So we train them, and among other things, we teach them to set up a camera in the back. The guy sets up a camera, and every lesson ends with roll points. He walks in, and he goes like this. You've all seen teachers do this, right? Opens the book and goes, Okay, we're going to do some role plays today. He's <laughs> right to the end of the thing. And he's taping himself, and he knows he's sending us a tape, and we're paying to do this lesson. <laughs> Again, we're all, and many of you were teachers. We do that. We adapt the curriculum, the information to suit our needs. And that's exactly what happens, is teachers give reasons for doing this, mostly practical considerations. I didn't have enough time. I had other things going on. We have an assembly, whatever. So I needed to truncate it to the most fun stuff. Okay? Um, and I, I'm adapting it to, to, to adapt to our rural students, or because half of these students, we have the, ur the classic, the urban uh, curriculum, half had the rural, and then there were controls. So the ones who got the more urban curricula would say, we're adapting it to make it more rural, or to make it more appropriate for our seventh grade students. Um, or to my, you know, actually my own teaching style. We found that teaching style is huge. So we're trying to really identify what are the styles that teachers are using to implement curriculum and maybe customize messages specifically for them or lessons that cater to those particular styles. So implementation quality, and again, for us, we're looking um, at the delivery quality, uh, you know, uh, the kinds of style that the teacher had, the fidelity of the implementation, um, and outcomes. It did have a significant 
effect. So implementation quality, quality, quality. So if we don't know, right? We, we want to measure outcomes. We want to measure drug use. We, if, if we don't find any effects, is it because we have a bad curriculum and we didn't adapt it well on our end, or is it because it's not being implemented in the field in the way that it should be? So implementation quality and adherence to it did have an effect on our particular outcomes in the Omnibus test. Delivery quality was significantly related to norms and substance use, but not related to efficacy, uh, to child's efficacy, kids e efficacy. Adherence was significantly related to norms, marginally related to substance use, and not related to efficacy. Do you want to step in there with any clarification? Well, I just think it's interesting that, that, that if, you, if you deliver it well, you have, you, you're animated in the way you teach it, and the students are engaged, and it's much more important more importantly, if you actually teach what we tell them to teach, which is consistent with that view of adaptation. And, and pure fidelity. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you explain maybe the efficacy part? I mean, it's not clear to me. Why it wouldn't correlate with efficacy? If it's not delivered appropriately, yeah. you go back? In, in the last two bullets. Yeah, efficacy means it's self efficacy, it's their belief that they can perform the behaviors. And so the, the, um, I, I think one of the problems we've always had with these particular set of RAAM strategies is because they're so indigenous to them. Students recognize them. You give them a self-report measure. Even if you haven't taught the curriculum, they say they do them all. And I think part of the problem is that when you're asking about that, they, they say they can do it because it's, it's the way they naturally do things. So I think there's a methodological problem inherent in, in the traditional design where you give people pre tests and post tests I, I would say. And oh, well, we have a bunch of things that we, you know, for for the future that we want to do, and things that are curious. We only have a few minutes, so I would like to go to questions. Questions? Yes. So, I guess most people here are in the high school era, so it's kind of interesting to look back. This is an increasingly long time ago. Um, so, when you're when you're looking at these populations, it obviously makes sense to address the different demographics, you know, in different regions. But within a within a, a high school cohort, you know there you know, you know even between you know saying demographics, there are even different subgroups. You know some people are definitely more susceptible than others. And so I can imagine, you know, uh, you know there's there's people who are kind of on the fringe, um, who you know maybe associate with groups that do drugs and groups that don't do drugs. There are those who don't associate, and there are those who are, you know, I mean just. Simplifying it for those who are very prone or engaging in it. And so I can imagine that in each of these three groups, they're going to respond very differently to these videos. And some may just look at it and be like, that's my aim. And some may be like, I don't know, I'm kind of hesitant towards it. And others may be like, wow, you know, this is great. So, you know, within this, are you targeting a certain one of those groups, or are you in fact somehow trying to put in a specific? facets that, that will try to attract each of those. Yeah, this is, the, the targeting, uh, it, it, this is a prevention intervention. Right? Not, we're not dealing at all with really high risk groups or treatment in terms of that. So we're, it's not like we're eliminating that, but we don't really address it. It's much more of a prevention, uh, inhibiting initiation, as well as decreasing use once it, it does happen. In terms of your really high risk kids, we don't really fully address that in this program. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really a good question, and, 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 it, and it, the answer is part of the, the thing. Uh, very, we could go on for an hour about this question, but but remember that there are multiple narratives in, in every lesson, and our goal is to select narratives that cut across a group of people to basically rebrand or restory what it means to be a drug user or a non-user, and basically create this image of non-use that is popular and exciting and mature. Because the indigenous narrative about drug users are that they are mature, adventurous, popular. There's a very positive image of people who use drugs in, 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 early, in middle school and in early high school. And, and frankly, when you measure the personalities of those kids, it's an accurate portrayal of them. Okay? Secondly, one of the things that we are looking at down the road when it comes into that participant thing is we have a number of people on our team that do social network analysis. And what we're trying to what we hope to be able to do is to track the message into networks, look at narrative networks, and track where it gets infused and not. 
There's a woman named uh, Linda Collins at Art University in the Methodology Center who's talked about adaptive interventions up there somewhere. And the idea being that once you get the message out, you see how it's working, and then stage two is to adopt to its failures. And so if you look at who the message reached and who it didn't reach, you can send a second message out, and, and based on who it's not reaching, decide what message it would be and how to get it into the, into the audience. Okay, but that's the future. Your work. Yeah. <laughs> Their program. Okay. So the second of the program was in different group or not? Okay. See, DARE started as a program and then came to the realization that they were a dissemination vehicle. That you have these officers who, by the way, deliver curriculum with greater fidelity and greater credibility to the kids and classroom teachers. So they had this training, marvelous training and dissemination vehicle but they didn't have the right curriculum, so they adopted ours. But we have not been in the field to evaluate it taught in that framework yet. You're looking for a donor? Seventh grade's been in for two years, and the elementary just went in this year. Yes, yeah, so they're using Keeping It Real now. The, the officers got retrained to use Keeping It Real. So we, we did that, that um, designer adaptation, right? So we had our curriculum, and then we adapted it specifically for offers, officers to go into the classroom. And I'll tell you this. Talk about constituencies. We have officers, we have sheriff's departments, we have education people, we have counseling people, you have the kids. So a lot of people at the table redesigning that one. And, and officers are not teachers, so the instructions are very exclusive. There is any interpretations that the group would lead to the adoption in group use like that. All, all we know is that, that there has been very successful in marketing our program and, and the number of schools and the number of countries has increased. We don't know yet. Starting next year, we're going to be evaluating it. We're doing a pilot study right now. Yeah, we're doing a pilot right now. Well, first of all, this was an incredible presentation. A really Thank you. So much. 